Sometimes you see a piece of equipment and think, I need to know more about that. This is what's called a V35 serial cable. It's been around since the 60s, as you can see. It's kind of given off some mainframe energy, and it's got me totally captivated. I mean, can you blame me? Look at this thing. On the other end, at least for this late 90s, early 2000s vintage I've got here, it's got this DB60 connector. Though this other one I've got has this smaller style connector that came in all sorts of varieties. I want to do something useful with this cable, that is, actually get some data flowing through it. Well, as it turns out, you need a lot of stuff to do anything interesting with this cable, and this isn't even all of it. The DB60 connector of that cable would typically go into a router like this Cisco 1600. It's got a serial connector on the back here to accept that end. The big guy would typically go into something called a CSU-DSU. In my case, I've got an ADTRAN unit here. It's got the big matching connector on the back there, and this one is labeled network. So what are we even looking at here? This is of course just a router, like the one that's in your house, except this one's slower and much older and from Cisco. This represents the local area network we all know and love that all our computers are running on inside our house. That V35 interface can be used to take the LAN over to something called a CSU DSU. Let me tell you, the folks in networking and telecommunications love three letter acronyms, maybe even more than our good friends at IBM. A CSU DSU takes that LAN information over my favorite cable here and translates it into something the telecom network understands. In our case, this is T1. I know this looks like ethernet, but no, this is the legendary T1. I remember thinking T1 was the fastest the internet was ever gonna get when, when I experienced it for the first time, a whole whopping 1.5 megabits per second. That's another CSU DSU. This one is what I can only describe as an older model, a teleprocessing products model one SM speed matching CSU DSU. On the back, of course, it has a spot for the T1 to come in from the telco. It's got the Winchester style connector here that we've been looking at and a normal DB25 serial. So that might be useful. This one's gonna perform the opposite function with another one of our cables here. I don't know what I'm gonna do on this end. I think I can hook up a computer directly over serial with this particular unit or we'll get another router in the mix, not really sure. But to bring it all together, we'll have a LAN over here going through our chonky cable into a CSU DSU. We'll have a T1 network between this one and the other CSU DSU and some other computers over here. And we're gonna try to talk across the two networks. To show it another way, straight from chapter one of the ADTRANS manual, you have two private LANs on the left and the right, and you have a T1 link connecting the two. The T1 would usually be a telecom provider, you can think of it as the public internet, you can think of these things as modems, and uh, my T1 telecom provider is gonna be this T1 crossover cable. We're not gonna worry too much about all the terms and acronyms and everything, I'm just gonna walk you through learning how to set this up, and we'll see if we can get communication going from one side to the other through my T1 link over these massive cables. Let's get into it. Let's take one more close look at this cable since it's why I'm gonna go through this T1 pane in the first place. I suspect this is gonna be really hard to get working. Of course, it's only using some of the Winchester connector pins. I have to imagine this is a generic connector used for all sorts of stuff. It looks very industrial. And it's got two points where you can screw in, I think, so you can't mess up the orientation. One of them accepts a screw, one of them is a screw, as you can see right there. Of course, where you're plugging this in has the right posts as well. Like I was saying, there's all sorts of different variants, and the most typical one I have, I have a bunch of them, is this style to the DB60 there. I have a bunch because a very generous viewer sent me a massive box of cables. A lot of them were the V35 cables. Send me back an email, you know who you are. I would like to reimburse you for shipping. But thank you very much. We're gonna put these to good use. And I just wanted to show some of the other options here. Here we've got two of the Winchester style connectors. Let's see if we can unplug that. One must be female, one must be male. Yep, so that's kind of cool. DB60 on one end, of course. And then this chonker, that is not a parallel cable, by the way, or a serial. Well, it is serial, but it's got three rows of pins. <laughs> one of the variations. I just wanted to show you this monstrosity. We've got the Winchester connectors. Someone needed a DB60 to DB60, and they 
cooked this up apparently. Just look how industrial and like serious these things are. Speaking of what you plug these into, let's talk about these things for a minute. I kept calling it a CSU DSU, but you may have noticed it actually says it's a TSU. Well, a TSU is able to multiplex the 24 channels of T1. T1, uh, now I'm not an expert, so take all of my uh, generic details here with a grain of salt, but T1 has multiple voice channels. You can run multiple phone calls over T1. And this thing, a TSU, lets you kind of split them up and multiplex them, so you can give like 10 to your voice system and 10 to your data for internet traffic or, or whatever. And it's very often the case, and I believe that's what I've got here, a TSU can act as a CSU DSU. So basically, we can think of this as a modem from the LAN over to T1. Like I was saying earlier, I don't know if any of this stuff works, so we've got a few backups. This gear here actually was generously donated by a viewer named Lee. This one, a viewer named Torrance, the same person that I bought those Nortel switches from. And this, a longtime viewer named Brooke. Now this, you'll see, is just a DSU. So I don't believe I'll be able to use that. I think I need both CSU and DSU in my application. I know I promised I'd not talk about this stuff, but we're not gonna use this one. Long story short, I think this is a TSU, so if I can't get this one working, we can try this one. And the worst, worst case scenario, if I can only get one of my units working here, is basically if you collect uh, early 2000 Cisco gear, like I do, they basically always come with at least one CSU DSU T1 card. So we've got options. Also of note, or at least I think it's interesting, every single one of these units has its power cord hardwired into the chassis. Was that like a common telecom thing back then? It's just weird to find three different brands all doing the same thing. What's up with that? Let's start by firing up this Cisco router. Speaking of power supplies, it uses this god-awful 14-volt DIN plug. So yeah, that was nice of Cisco to do that. Oh, and uh, fun fact for you. This is a 1600, 1700. They're kind of of the same era. You see these nubs right here? Well, the spot where you would like mount this to a wall fits perfectly in there. And they kind of like stack as one unit. I don't know why you'd ever do that, but there you go. We'll get this on the serial console, fire this up just to see how it is. I don't recall if I've ever powered this on, and I've certainly never configured a serial port like this, so that'll be a learning experience. Powering up here, some lights are blinking, and it's silent. No fans or anything. It's up, and it seems healthy, so I'm sure it has a password. Yeah, and the password is not admin. So we're gonna have to reboot it and try to clear the password. I'll have to look up how to do that. I'm restarting it and we need to issue a break to hopefully get into something called Ramon 1997. Wow, it is not working. There we go, that was too fast. Okay, we're gonna type confreg ox2142. This is going to tell it to boot without its existing config, meaning without a password. So I can say reset. There's something very eerie about being at this Cisco CLI without hearing fans blaring next to me. <laughs> Look at that. They still call it the Cisco Internetwork Operating System instead of simply iOS. That's what it stands for. Apple actually licensed, leased something, that name from them. Probably a pretty good deal for Cisco. Never accept the initial configuration dialog. That's a good sign though, it means it was obviously reset. And it's spitting out about links going down. We can say enable, and then I can say write to write that config. Anyway, it's factory reset now, no password. I'm gonna power cycle it just to make sure it worked. I always forget to do this. You want to comp T and then configure the register with 2102, at least in this router's case, to go back to its regular behavior where it's gonna load from the config, the config being this blank one that I'm writing out right now. Just kind of poking around here. We should be able to configure that serial zero, the one serial interface that I'm plugging my big cable into with an IP address and everything. So I think this part's fine for now. Let's plug in that Adtran unit and just see what it does. Did I mention I don't know what I'm doing? Uh, I'm just gonna power it on. Or I plugged it in, maybe it's got a switch. It does have a switch. Lights, initializing, okay. Now the trick is, oh, it's doing this little test sequence. 
All tests pass. Let's go. I have to configure this one the same as whatever CSU DSU I use on the other side. And because I'm using this crossover business, they rely on a clock to send the data, obviously. One side has to be the clock. One side needs to just listen to that clock. Anyway, it, it should be should be straightforward. Okay, this is that T1 stuff I was talking about. This is the configuration menu for the network interface, meaning the T1 interface. This is all looking pretty typical. Clock source. This one is getting its clock source from the other one, but I believe internal. Yeah, I can tell this one to be the clock and I can tell that other one to get it from here. It's okay, we're gonna leave everything factory for now. I'm liking this. Uh, should we just plug it into the Cisco? I don't know if you're supposed to do this while these are uh, plugged in, but that's what we're doing. The star of the show. Let's get this guy in there. I can't imagine this is high voltage stuff. This is not going well. This cable won't fit properly. So it's got this screw and it's supposed to screw into this post and the post is supposed to recess down around this screw so that you get a full tight connection. And this area in here is just not big enough for this post or this post is bigger than normal. Luckily I have that ridiculous adapter I was showing you. It fits in just fine. Let me screw it down for you. As you can see, totally flush, no problem. I do have the correct cable to move forward. So we'll get this guy here and this one into the router. Here's where I'm gonna start doing a little bit of guesswork. So we'll configure from terminal. We're gonna configure the serial interface. We want encapsulation PPP. We're going to want to set the clock rate to the max T1 speed. If it says unknown clock rate. That's probably not good. We need to give it an IP address. Let's just be simple and this will be 2.1 and then let's bring the interface up. Show IP in brief. Okay. So it doesn't see anything on the other end. That's not too surprising. Well, it's getting interesting. And by that, I mean, it's not really working. This guy here was, he needs some work. You plug him in, all the lights kind of flash. These buttons are, are sticky. He was acting funny. So I pulled out the Motorola, which is indeed a CSU DSU and appears to be working <laughs> as far as I can tell. I've made two bits of progress. The T1 line is plugged in between them. And when I pull it, they both go into an alarm state. That one's red there. This one's complaining all over the place. So they can talk over T1, I think. If I plug this back in, their alarm states should clear. Their alarm states should clear. There they go. They were probably doing chattering back and forth, trying to figure each other out. So I think the T1 connection's probably okay. I have this set to internal clock. I have this set to network clock. Like I was saying, there's a clock that they're using, you know, I don't know how to explain it. One needs to be internal, one needs to be on the network. They can't both be network in my crossover situation here. Now the task at hand is to convince myself that these two can talk to each other. I'll show you what I came up with here. I think that clock rate information was uh, a bad tutorial. So I've got no clock rate set for now anyway. We'll see if this old version of iOS can do it. I recently learned instead of typing exit to get back in the hierarchy of menus, you can type end. Oh yeah, look at that, way better. If we take a look at our interfaces, serial is on the bottom and it is down, totally down. We can issue a show controller serial zero and it at least knows that the V35 serial cable is attached. If I pull it, actually, actually I'll show you that right now. I'm gonna go pull the cable, run that again. No serial cable attached. So that's good, I guess. I don't know what to make of all this other information. So I'm gonna do some more research and see if I can't at least get the AdTran talking to the Cisco unit or get their lights to show up so that they know they're connected. The plot thickens. I plugged another cable from this Motorola unit into the Cisco immediately. The serial light came on over here. We've got some CS and TD activity. I'll t I can never remember what these stand for. I'll have to look that up. I'm starting to think this adapter I was using that I could get to go flush might be some sort of crossover cable or is somehow interfering with things physically. That's my best theory right now. So I'm gonna just try to jam in that original cable that I couldn't get to sit fully flush. I should have just done this anyway. And we'll see where we can get. Check this manufacturing day on this adapter cable, March of 1995. Wow. Oh yeah, that was totally it. So I took the original cable I was trying 
and I just have it jammed in enough to make a good connection. This thing lit up, its interface is up on the console, and of course we can see TD, RS, and CS here, and on the other end of our T1 link, we can see RD flashing away. And most important of all, on the console, we can see serial zero has come up, and if we show IP interface brief, she's up. What does it mean? Here's where we're at. We have a local area network here, connected over V35 to this CSU DSU, which is translating that into T1 over to this CSU DSU. Oh, and his top is off because he, he had a tough time during shipping. So I'll have to fix that. I've got another one of those big old connectors here, and I need something to plug it into. I was looking everywhere through my stuff, and the only other item I have with that D60 serial connector is this Cisco 2500 series router, and that's what we're going to throw on there. It's got two serial connectors. We'll be able to give one of those an IP on the same subnet, I think. And then finally, we should be able to ping this router from this one and vice versa, and we'll know it's going over the T1 connection. This might be the finest setup I've come up with yet. Look at all this stuff. Always good to use your cables. Let's power this thing on. I'm already seeing stuff that I like. More lights here. The new Clab Retro theory of T1 operation is that you want as many lights as possible that aren't error, alarm, or test. Let's hop on the serial console of this bad boy and get it configured. Our best friend, show IP interface brief, tells us that serial zero, the one I'm plugged into, is up. But of course, it doesn't have an IP address. Let's go take care of that. So we'll configure serial zero. We'll give it an IP. I think I was 2.1 on the other one. This will be 2.2. I do not know if I need encapsulation PPP, but I did it on the other one, so I'm doing it on this one. And it's already up. Okay. We're not out of the woods yet. The question is, can I ping the other router? <laughs> okay. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. So this thing is 192.168.2.2. I just pinged out over B35 to a CSU DSU, which is converting to T1 to this CSU DSU, back over to this router, and I was able to ping it. Let's go the other direction. I, I, I can't believe this is working. The only configuration I did on these things is I left this one on network clock, and I put that one as the internal clock, meaning it's generating the clock signal for the T1. On the routers, it's very simple. You give them an IP, you set encapsulation to PPP, those are literally the only two configurations I've done on either of these routers. Of course, bringing the interface up, and it's just working. We're back on the other router now, and we're going to ping dot two. This is so cool. I don't know why it's cool, but it's cool. There is something so satisfying about seeing all this old gear with very minimal configuration running perfectly like the day it was built over 20 years ago, I think, in each of these items cases just chugging along and not to mention two of these massive v35 cables in the mix look at this setup i love it this was actually a lot more fun than i thought it was going to be because it was easier than i thought it was going to be i've learned previously with my t1 adventures really all you need to know especially when you're doing this like crossover cable local stuff is the clock thing one of them needs to be internal one of them needs to be external and it just kind of works as you saw very minimal configuration, which is pretty fascinating. And I'm really happy I got to use a bunch of these Cisco cables. They are really high quality. And what I think makes them most impressive is just the sheer amount of actual cables running through under this sheathing. And so they're just really thick and well-made. And it just has this industrial professional feel to it. I think this is going to be my last video of the year. Thank you to all of you for making 2024 statistically the best year that this channel has ever experienced. Believe me when I say I've got more on the way and I couldn't do it without all of you. I love seeing people view and enjoy the videos and comment and subscribe. And a huge thanks to my Patreon supporters. You really do make it possible for me to spend the time down here and explore all this equipment and gather more of it and have a really fun time with it and share it with all of you. But as always, thank you for watching. And if you made it this far, I hope you're as surprised as I am that you just made it all the way through a video about big cables. Catch you in the next video.